Does anyone in here actually ever fried their central nervous system? Because I'm curious what it tastes like. Anyone? <laughs> Is Trent here? Is Trent here? Trent? He's not allowed to ask questions, that's why. Is Ben going to teach Dan stuff? <laughs> if we get a final score, did we have a win or Carlton? Oh yeah, that's a good point. Um, mobile phones, please don't answer them during this and talk well. Well, this guy's talking. Chip off the old block over there. Well done, Maxi. Good day. Thanks for joining us at this late hour, Dan. And thanks for flying across, mate. Um, I'm going to ask a few really basic questions and then I'll throw to the crowd and they can ask you questions and you can answer with the mic. Uh, basic stuff. When did you start powerlifting? Uh, 2007. <laughs> uh, 2007, just had a friend that had convinced me to stop just lifting weights to lift weights and start competing. So, But been lifting weights since uh, maybe 97. So. Okay. How many comps a year do you do roughly? Uh, comps, last year was a lot, like four or five, and then uh, probably just two or three every other year. Uh, you train a lot. How's your central nervous system? <laughs> <laughs> You've got to tell me. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's doing okay. <laughs> How often do you train? Uh, as far as training, probably five to six times a week. So you rest once or twice? Once or twice a week. <laughs> Where do you train? Um, so the gym I train at is called uh, Boss Barbo Club, and it's uh, it was my garage, and now it's uh, now it's a gym, and it's in California and Mountain View. So if you guys are ever out there, you can come swing by. Uh, some <laughs> smelly smell. <laughs> Mark Bell. <laughs> He's all right. <laughs> Stan Anthony, good guy. Yeah, Stan's a real good guy. Who's a douchebag? I'm not around those guys too much. No, I think a lot of people complain about Scott, but he's always been nice to me, so I have no, nothing bad to say, and all the stories I hear are very entertaining. So. When you started in the sport, did you have any idols? Uh, I think just, you know, like anybody else who's read up on powerlifting and seen maybe Ed Cohn. Can you beat Ed Uh Right now, yeah, now, he's, now. he's kind of retired. So. <laughs> 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 Would you most like to compete against today? Uh, well, I think I just want to compete against the other people who are tops and you know the most competitive guys. Who's that? All I think all the weight classes. Uh, Kate Weber. There's a couple Russian guys. I think like Malinchev and. Pozdev, Balayev, and uh, yeah, I like you know my Canadian competitors like Jay, Jay, Jay Nera, and uh, yeah, I guess if I stay at 242, then 
Weber. Okay. <laughs> Can you take him? Uh, see, I was being watched live back in, the in Canada. <laughs> right, you guys ask him the questions. <laughs> put your hand up and he'll call out. No stupid questions. <laughs> Come on in. Go, come to the back. Um, your food for the day, Dan. What do you eat for the for food for the day, right from breakfast, right to the end of the day? Oh. Uh, <laughs> can, uh, usually breakfast will just be a lot of eggs. And it really depends, like if I'm if I'm following a strict diet or not. If I follow a strict diet, it could be something like, you know, something boring like eggs and then chicken and hamburger stuff like that, uh, four or five times a day. If it's a uh, <laughs> if it's more my normal diet, then uh, probably have eggs and bacon, sausage, stuff like that, and like real hamburgers or burritos throughout the day, just a lot of calories. You don't calorie count? Not calorie counting. <laughs> if you have any questions about macros, I will not know the answer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, actually, when I've when I've had a competition where I've needed to lose weight, then I have a I have a friend who's uh, you know is a nutrition guy, so that's what he does. He just writes that for me, and um, I cook. My uh, fiance is back there, and she's also awesome at preparing the food and helping me. <laughs> so. Hey, Matt. Yeah, Dan. Um, what do you like to train at? And then when it comes to competing, how far away do you start cutting weight? And what's extreme for you? How many pounds could you drop, say, in a week? And what me methods do you use, whether it's sauna, um, one <laughs> I think I know where we're going with that. So, uh, for most of the last year since I've been competing at 220, uh, mostly walking around, I would be between 245, 246. Um, so, you know, the last few weeks before a competition, my diet guy, you know, I started listening to the things he had to say a little more. I was a little more pressure to make Glorious. make the weight. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I do. I do like cookies, and so yeah. So try to get down to about 238 to 240 the week before the competition um, to prepare to cut. I basically do like a water cut for about a I don't know a day and a half or so. So to prepare for that throughout the week leading up, you drink a lot of water, like several gallons a day, and. Um, following your last workout, which for me is usually like a Monday before the last, well, Monday would be the last workout. So then from Tuesday on, you're kind of done eating carbohydrates. Uh, that helps you to not, not hold in water. So lots of water, no carbs, and then just at the end of the week, kind of drop out all sodium. And this allows you to start depleting the water very rapidly. So to cut from about 238 pounds to 220. Um, once you stop, once you're about 40 hours out, basically stop eating, stop drinking, and uh, just some basic like uh, water, water pills and laxatives instead of, you know, if you're not drinking coffee or whatever you normally, just so you can kind of keep keep sweating and keep dehydrating. Do you use the sauna? Yeah, I'll use the sauna a little bit. Usually just once, so maybe. <coughs> I think once you've done some cuts, you kind of know how quickly your body will like lose the weight. So whenever I would arrive, wherever I'm competing, then I usually go to the sauna once for an hour and a half, two hours, just to try to get down to the right weight that I know I'll be able to finish the weight cut from. I think like too much time in the sauna is probably draining. So even though it takes uh, a lot of hours, it's, uh, it's better to just do it steadily. So. It's a good question. So the rehydration is pretty much like the opposite. So instead of no carbs, now you want to eat a lot of carbs because that will help you pull the water in. Lots of salt, lots of sugar, and not like a lot of protein, just the normal amount. So pretty much is eating a ton. I think the, the ratio I've been like told is if you have uh, seven pounds of weight loss, then you want to have about five pounds of fluid and two pounds of food per, <coughs> per seven pounds. So you've got to put down a lot of food over the next, you know, next 24 hours to gain back 20 pounds or more. I think if you do it well, you can uh, 
yeah, you can gain above what you cut from. So, yeah, the last three meets I've done in 2013, or I guess 2012, sorry, would be like cutting from 238, 238, and then one at the Olympia was 241 and a half. So that was uh, that was the most painful. <laughs> But in all those meets, I was able to gain the weight back to two or three pounds above where I started the night before. So, so on, on the platforming, when you're lifting as a 220, how much you're actually weighing a day of lifting? Like 240. Another another key would be if you feel like you're gaining the weight back, but it's just, you know, like you're just feeling bloated, then a little caffeine at the end will help to stop. You know, you don't need to just feel bloated. This is not it's not for geared lifting. So, just uh, having the carbs to pull the water into your muscles is what matters, not you know underneath your skin and your fingers and your face. So <laughs> that's just for style points. What's a basic rundown of your your training? I mean, I've read a lot of it. A lot of guys probably haven't. How you train? Do you use some of these Russian templates? I know you're a big fan of Westside. Um, there's also <laughs> there's also the cube, which looks like it works. We've got a couple of guys that are doing that. But what what do you do? Well, I think like any anything will work for a while. Uh, I mean, my my program is basically that I squat twice a week, I deadlift once a week, and uh, I'll bench or do upper body motions like twice a week. No, uh, no assistance days. It's just uh, either heavy or kind of a high volume day. So, what I've basically kind of come up with is when I'm further away from a competition, there'll be more volume. So. Like Monday, Wednesday, I always squat. So Monday would be uh, back squatting day. Wednesday, front squatting. When I front squat, it's high volume. And when I back squat, it's usually just to lift heavy. And then closer to meet, drop drop the volume of the front squatting and it's just two days heavy of uh, back squatting. So I know people have asked me like videos on the internet that like, oh, you just lifted heavy like two days ago. You got a competition. So well, yeah. Uh, if you're used to lifting quite heavy, then actually I'm taking a longer rest before my next <laughs> before before the competition than I would before my next workout normally, so still feel very very recuperated. You mentioned front squats now. Yeah. You, you do, I've seen your front squats are incredible. You, it's a staple for you. You love it. Yeah. The reason I started front squatting, uh, I talked to a buddy, uh, Sam Bird. He seems like he knows what he's doing with the squatting, and he he told me his workouts were based on like a speed day of squatting and a uh, high volume front squatting day and when I thought about it I it sounded like he actually did more work on his front squatting day than his, his back squatting day so I had done front squats as a limbic lifter a lot so I think it's like, all right I'll put this back in my program and uh, yeah so that's that's been hugely helpful I think a lot of people will probably find that when you squat and you're like you fail you wind up doing like a good morning and uh, I did that for a long time. I was stuck at like a 600 back squat. And uh, you're looking at it like, oh, my back isn't strong enough. I keep, you know, whenever I fail, I'm standing up, but then I'm bending over and I can't straighten out. So I kept thinking based on like the west side training, I needed to strengthen my back and do more good mornings. But once, uh, once I'd seen some uh, Russian lifters with some huge like quad development and then Sam Burr telling me, you know, do front squatting kind of put that together and realized I was a uh, good morning I was doing good mornings on my squat because my legs were too weak not not my back being not my back being the problem so I basically couldn't keep my legs underneath the weight that I was squatting because they weren't strong enough so you know your legs kind of straighten out and then you just get buried so I'm sure a lot of people have experienced that and yeah so the front squatting forces you to never be able to good morning away so you have to just train your just train your legs. So, for me, that worked really well. So, I have a belief that um, strongest guy in the class generally doesn't have the most muscle. I think we've gone away from that because we've used equipment and other sort of stuff. Clearly, the guy with the most muscle lifts the most weight. I know John Cook said that back in the day, and, and <coughs> the truth again, because we're watching these elite raw power lifters come through now that seriously nearly look like bodybuilders. They have a lot of muscle. Uh, do you, and Stan Anthony, if you guys don't know, I didn't mention before, Dan Green's got two all-time, all-fed world records, right? That's like 40 years of powerlifting in two different categories. Dan Green has lifted more weight than any other man. 
And when you look at him, you can see how much muscle he's got. Stan Effetting now has, they, they, they broke, they took a John Cole record each, which had been around for 40 years. Now, when you look at Dan, clearly this man has a lot of muscle. Now, very, there's going to be some guys lifting tomorrow that clearly have a lot of muscle. They're going to lift astronomical weights. So, building muscle as well as strength, do you? I know you don't directly aim to be a bodybuilder, but you seriously pack a lot of muscle on your five foot seven frame. So, he thinks he's five ten, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> but clearly you have a lot of muscle, and then the end result is two all, no one's lifted more weight than you in two different categories. Do you, what do you think about that? Do you think having a lot of muscle is beneficial or doesn't help at all? Yeah, I think, uh, no, you gotta have some muscle. I mean, raw powerlifting, you know, you're not wearing a shirt, so you have to have some you have to have some chest development and you know you you're not sitting into a suit so you've got to have some some thighs I guess right uh, yeah I, mean, I think to support the lifting it definitely helps to gain gain weight I mean benching if you watch raw benchers they all look like bodybuilders anyway that are all the top guys so like you just don't see skinny guys lifting you know 600 pound benches uh, unless it's in a shirt right so <laughs> Um, I think squatting is sort of half and half where you need you don't need your you know your spine to be massive to have the strength but certainly your legs you know having a having your thighs built up and deadlifting you probably don't need to be so massive but if you look at any guy who's a good deadlifter there's always a lot of upper back like lats and traps develop so there's a very easy way to uh, build that up with uh, some of the techniques from I guess you know from bodybuilding what do you do uh, just a lot of rows, so I like dumbbell rows. I know you love pin leg rows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're for people that can't bend rows, is that right? <laughs> for a long time, I would basically train like a bodybuilder before I started competing, so I did just years and years of bent over rows, so I think for me those will run, run their course, but I have... Uh, I want to agree with you. Ed Cowan loved bent over. <laughs> yeah. Go figure. No, I think a lot of guys can you know, put up huge bent over rows, that's a pretty obvious way to build up your upper back strength. Uh, no, it's like, if you have trouble locking out a deadlift, a lot of time it's because your lats are not helping to pull the weight in and stabilize your spine. And uh, The bigger your lats are, the more you can basically have the weight hang in front of you, but not feel like it's getting out of control. So, yeah, I mean, that's huge. And not to mention when, you're, when your lats are stronger, you've stabilized your back squatting and you've tightened up your shoulders when you bench too. I mean, the last thing you need is like a shoulder injury when you're benching, so. Have you had many big injuries? Uh, no, not really. No. Yeah, just uh, You've got lots of muscle? No, nah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, just being just being smart and lucky. When did you decide to switch to sumo deadlift? All right, so uh, yeah, I guess I trained a long time as just conventional and I peaked in meets like around 300 kilos so but I'd gotten stuck there for a long time so yeah people have asked me like why did you switch well at first it was very hard I switched over to sumo and I could only lift like about I don't know I guess it would be about 240k <laughs> after six weeks of trying it so you know I'm like way 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 behind uh, I thought it would be good at it because of you know good hip flexibility but it just took a long time to build up. I probably tried about three different times lifting like six weeks just sumo each time before it felt like it was actually starting to feel good. So yeah, I mean if you have a bit of trouble learning the sumo, it's you know, it can be discouraging. Uh, I think the third time around it finally started to give me the, the hope that I'd be able to surpass my conventional which was still just stuck for like a year, 660. So. Poor you. <laughs> Tell them well, I mean, if that's what, if that's what you're satisfied with. <laughs> I know what you do for deadlift training. I'm not sure everybody else does. Can you please explain the deadlift part? Sure. His deadlift session is called the deadlift part. <laughs> so I had, uh, while I was stuck at this uh, 660 deadlift, I'd seen a buddy, and uh, his name was Craig Terry. He, he's it's an American guy, mostly like 198 and 220 pound class. And mostly in single play, he'd pretty much been like the number one ranked American for like two decades in a row. Now he had the build where you could like reach down to his knees without bending. But when I watched him work out, he basically would just hit max reps from the floor. And then he would, you know, 10 minutes later, hit max reps from the weights pulling on blocks. 
and then he would go to a set of deficit deadlifts and you know just hit like as many reps as he could there so just a ton of deadlifting and I thought alright I've got to try that so uh, the results were speaking for themselves I think he was like 198 and I saw him make 751 this is like a drug free guy so pretty impressive and uh, yeah so what actually happened is I started doing that for the sumo pulls so if you guys have uh, tried learning the sumo pulls and you're having some trouble pulling with the weights elevated on like four inch blocks that's the the best the best exercise people say like well okay why don't you put your weights lower if you have the problem of having weak hips but I say well okay if you can't do the technique properly why do you make it harder instead of making it easier if you put the weights up on blocks it's an easier exercise and you can really learn to dial the hip hip action in so yeah for me that was that was the key I will get you to show us some of the techniques later um, so surely you don't do all that work in one session yeah, yeah so I think uh, it's not it's not totally unique to have several different deadlifting sets in one workout uh, so definitely not like a max effort workout but when I'm when I'm deadlifting I'll basically start pulling off the floor and if that feels good then I pull off pull off of blocks if that feels good uh, and I like to train conventional too so you get like a deficit deadlifts uh, as like a third exercise a lot of times or just regular conventional and if that feels good then also stiff leg deadlifts which are if you're not doing those I mean those are those are like the poor man's uh, back extension but I feel like they're quite a bit better than just using a machine to train your back so well, that's interesting so you, you really rate the stiff leg deadlift highly yeah and there's a couple of different ways that you can train stiff leg deadlifts if you do it more with your back kind of rounded over you can have it apply much better to uh, conventional deadlifts um, you can also train them like a Romanian deadlift which is where your back would be arched hips way back and uh, then it becomes a really you know really good hamstring exercise so why are you so flexible? I mean if you guys haven't seen him do stiff legs you are, you're really missing out why are you so flexible? Is it the cheerleading that you used to do? No, nah, I think it's uh, a <laughs> 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 that was a uh, no, it's just the, uh, <laughs> if, you, if you learn to do Romanian deadlifts, you will have the flexibility. Yeah. That's it. So you developed it, so you were... So I did that as like, when I was just training to be stronger and, and more muscular, then yeah, ha the hamstrings came about with the, uh, the Romanian deadlifts. At first, yeah, if you try to deadlift with your back arched and your legs straight, you will not be able to bend down to your feet, but um, yeah, as you do it more with the weights, you'll become stronger and more flexible and you'll put on a ton of muscle, so... We were talking earlier, and talking about Kate Webber, and you made a very interesting comment. Uh, Kate Webber's a very, very strong lifter, but he squats with a narrow stance and not really a high bar, but sort of. And um, you mentioned that um, if he changed his squatting action, he would get he would total a lot more, which is right. So you actually maximise all your leverages, and you think it's important that a lifter should do that because the sport of powerlifting requires you to lift the most weight. So Kate Webber's a uh, I think your total's 9.40 or 50, around there, something like that, Max? How much? 9.27, he's only a kid, 23 or 24. But if you see squatting action, it's very unique in the world of powerlifting, I think it'd be fair to say. It's like a Olympic squat. Yeah, yeah, very, very deep and close stance. And you said that um, if he changed his action, obviously, and it sort of ate what you did or what some of the big squatters do, you think you can get his total right up there? You think everybody should do that? Yeah, so one of the one of the things I like is when you have a a long time before a before a meet, instead of just training the same like low bar parallel squat, you know week in week out, um, you can switch and train like a high bar squat for the first several weeks, and then as you get close to the competition, switch back to the more of those traditional powerlifting like wide wide stance, low bar, parallel depth. Um, when you train like how Kate squats in a meet, you can put on a ton of muscle because you're going through a greater range of motion. Um, and certainly that will all carry over really well once you go back to the regular style. So we'll not lose any of your strength by uh, skipping away from the yeah. parallel squats for a while. He's going to be one to watch in the future because he's only a kid, isn't he? He's packing some serious muscle. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're going to get you to 
Yeah, it, it, you want to show these guys how you deadly? Can you also demonstrate the stiff legs that you do? <laughs> Ricky Goodyear wants me to get him as injured as possible. <laughs> stay open. Once your knees kind of push in, you push your hips back. And once you push your hips back, you lose all the leverages that you can gain from the hips wide. So the hips are wide, if the knees are wide, then you can uh, you can use all of your, your leg strength. Uh, it's going to take a little longer to get the weight moving because it's more of a, it is a little more of a squat, but uh, it doesn't have to only be a squat. You can, a little athleticism, you can, you can pull it like a deadlift while, you know, getting the leg drive of you know, like a, a good sumo technique. So, yeah, I mean, I, I pretty much will get my, my footing, choose my, uh, you know, line up where I'm gonna set my, my hands. And then uh, I like to breathe in before I reach for the bar. Uh, obviously, if you wear a belt, it's, uh, it's a little easier to breathe in while you're standing up than when you're bent over, I find. So once I breathe, breathe in, bent down, you can basically bail up a lot of pressure against the belt which, uh, yeah, that can help you quite a lot once you're trying to get the weight moving so the torso's not, not collapsing. Uh, anyway, so yeah, I breathe in before I reach down, take my grip, and then just try to basically open the hips up while I'm pulling up. So here, and uh, yeah, just pressing out. So when I set my feet, I like to make sure I can feel that uh, the grip of the floor. If you are uh, looking to get the outward pressure, then that seems like a must to me, but not everyone does that. So, <laughs> so what are the biggest mistakes people make when they're trying to do sumo? Uh, let's see. Like I said, the biggest mistake is just that you're not opening your knees. So if you're deadlifting and you try to start here, but your knees collapse, you just kind of do like a wide stance, stiff leg deadlift, and that's, you know, it's not helping anything. So. The whole point of a sumo is you can have your hips a little lower than a conventional. So once your hips shoot up, no good. I have a young boy that trains in my gym that's a phenomenal deadlift. He uh, pulled 290 and 700 kilos. We are um, very, very long arms. He actually remarked out of life. He tried sumo for a little while and found he couldn't lock it out. Uh, Mark, can you come up here? Yes. You, yeah, come up. Yeah. Just show. Um, I just want to show you. Come on. Now, Mark is moved back to the bench Can you show Dan how your sumo, if he can pick anything up? Because I think that if you could master the sumo with the length of your arms and your absolute strength, that your deadlifting could, like, you know, yours is plateaued as we know just like Dan's did, and I think that you could become one of the... His deadlift videos went viral when that E.T. Wade saw Martin deadlifting 290 at 79, at 19 years old. Uh, I think that you could be something special, but you've got the best, one of the best deadlifts in the world here. Just show him what you did. See if you can pick anything up on what Martin does wrong, maybe. <laughs> no, no, not, 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 besides the pants and the haircut. Can I? See what I mean by his arm length? It's ridiculous. Yeah. So why does he have so much, is there anything apparent in that why he has so much trouble locking his sumo deadlift out? Yeah, I think uh, there's two ways you can lock out the, the sumo deadlift. Thanks, man. And it can, be, it can be subtle, but you can, you can see. So uh, one way to do it, which is more how I like to do it, is to basically, as you drive up, have the legs straighten out first the bar pulling in, and then just finish with the back. Mm. So you basically locked out your knees first, yeah. so you can maximize your leg drive. The second way, which is kind of what, what you're doing, which is more of the uh, pulling it up, and then as you pass the knees, your, your knees stay bent while you're pulling back. So you're trying to lock out your hips and your knees at the same time. Uh, with the sumo, it's just, uh, 
I mean, if you can pull that off, that works great. The, the tough part for me is, yeah, you get a little more friction uh, pulling past your thighs like that. And uh, I find it very hard to squeeze the, squeeze the like hips shut, <laughs> the lockout when you've got the knees still kind of bending and pulling back. Uh, Do you mind looking at anybody else? Either way, so. Yeah. Well, he's plateau. You know, he's plateaued, and we think that's like you found the answer. <coughs> we think that's going to be the answer for Martin, but um, we don't have any sumo deadlifters in our gym at all. So yeah. I might as well learn from you. I just want to ask you. I've seen some of your deadlift videos. And before you actually lift, you take a breath, you look like you squeeze your your, your lats or yeah. you tense your before you actually lift it. Is that what is that like mainly for other than what? Yeah, so when I breathe in and I've got my arms like basically flexing my stomach, yeah. chest and lats, uh, I guess I like to think of it as like you're 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 just getting your whole torso as, as rock solid as you can. It's like you're as though your upper body was like a battering ram. Uh, a lot of times you hear people say like, well, you have to ease the weight off the ground when you pull sumo. You can't be explosive like if you're a conventional deadlifter. And uh, to me, that just sounds like you know it's too hard for them. But there's no reason why an athletic person can't be explosive in a sumo pull too. So just getting that uh, tension built up beforehand is really helpful. So you can drive with your legs as hard as you want. I feel like your upper body is not gonna not gonna collapse. Uh, no. Do you find your weight is strong at all, or do you just not do that? Uh, no, actually, that's a fair question. I think uh, two years ago, I had more trouble where I would miss weights off the floor. And over the past year, I almost, I had probably done a lot less of the black pulls and a lot more of just pulling off the floor. And so, yeah. Was able to pull everything off the floor, and then I was having a little bit of trouble locking some of the weights out. Uh, what I found it wasn't so much the strength of pulling off the blocks; it was it was more of a technical issue that I had, and that was uh, the thing I was saying about sort of the hand width, the uh, the finished position. Basically, if you have your hands crossing in front of your thighs at the you know at the right place, it finishes great. The bar can slide against your thighs if you have a very narrow narrow grip and your hands have to slide in front of your thighs, well, the bar is gonna push out in front of you. So that's okay, but it just has to be accounted for. And I was having a problem of, uh, I was having that problem. So I had to adjust my, my hand width, and uh, that that was the biggest thing. So the legs, the stance, and then the hand hand spacing. Yeah. Um, with the, the foot placement, how did you work out your optimal foot width for, for pulling sumo? Well, at first, uh, pulling weights with the weights elevated on blocks, like I said, if you're trying to learn how to pull sumo, that's the best way to go. It will allow you to get in a position where you are you can build the strength in your hips without having your flexibility kind of hold you back at first. So you can build the strength to press the weight up with your hips open and your legs wide. Uh, as your hips get stronger, then you'll naturally be able to like move the weights lower, maybe on like a two inch block, or down to the floor and then not lose the uh, integrity of like a sumo pull, not have your hips buckle inwards. So when you build up the strength, you naturally have the tendency to leverage the weight by going wider and wider. So I mean, at first I was pretty much like building it up until I was all the way out to the weights and what I, or yeah, my feet all the way out to the plates. Uh, what I've realized more recently is now that my uh, leg strength has continued to go up, um, I can bring my feet back in a little bit closer I can still have my knees out just as wide, but don't need my feet to be as wide. So, uh, your stance is going to be based on you know your leg strength, your hip strength, uh, your upper back strength. Uh, if your legs are stronger, you can bring your feet in. If your hips are strong, you can bring your feet out. So, <laughs> uh, and then there's a blend. I mean, it's always better to be stronger in every area, but you can play it to your your strengths. Anyone else? Hey, man. Yeah, I was what I was trying to chat to you before you were saying to me that um, explain to me you don't even have a monolith, correct? So do you yeah. do you do you find that um, you get stronger by training the fact that you're walking out 300, 330 um, kilos, then walking back? Is that do you think that's making you stronger than continuously squatting on a monolith? Honestly, since I'm not squatting on a, squatting on a monolith, I really couldn't say. <laughs> Hard to make the comparison. 
Well, then do you find do you find it hard to transition or um, then squatting on a monolith? Yeah, at first, uh, since I'd always squatted it out of a rack, and then the first time or two I'd been to a meet that had a monolith and there's no like warm up for it, that was a little odd, you know, not realizing how wide you set your feet and stuff, but. Uh, now I've done enough meets, so I don't I actually I mean it's definitely an advantage when you go to the meet you can squat in a monolith. That's that's pretty clear. I don't know how much of an advantage you get from walking the weights out. Uh, if you've never done it, then yeah, I mean I would think there's got to be some, some some advantage to it, just in terms of building that strength up. You said just uh, started training in '97. How much did you weigh then, and where do you think? Like I'm, I'm very light. I'm very tall for the 90 kilo class, so I'm moving up classes. When do you think you found your right weight for your height? Uh, I think when I was 90, 97, I was like 160 pounds. <laughs> so I used to go on high school. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a smash 75 kilos. That's like me. <laughs> when I used to lift up. <laughs> you, think, you think 110 is going to be your best weight class? Maybe. Yeah, I think so. Would you go on yeah, the best tip was definitely just being told to front squat. Uh, I mean, some of the other things I had like had as far as like eye-opening experiences. Uh, yeah, when I had uh, gone to Russia in 2010 and seen like just a you know totally different style of lifter. Uh, so yeah, when I was in Russia, it was apparent that all the lifters had been like well groomed in their technique from a very early age. I think as an American, I'm used to, you know, you go to a gym when you're a teenager and you see some people like curling and bench pressing as so you do that, eventually you might decide you're going to squat and then eventually you probably learn from somebody who's a better squatter how to stop doing what you're doing and squat properly. Uh, it seemed to me when I watched the Russians that they had all learned how to squat like properly like as soon as they learned how to walk. So it was like... <laughs> it was like they had never squatted improperly, and, and all the Americans I've, you know, lifted with, it's like you've unlearned bad techniques, and then you're trying to, trying to right the ship. But well, you speak very highly of the Russian lifters. I know there's quite a few boys in here that do some of the Russian you know, shakos and some of the other stuff. Uh, have, you, have you ever done those programs or tried them or thought about them? Or what do you think of them? Uh, yeah, I've never, never really tried the shako program. And I can't say I'm really that familiar with it. I've, I've read a little bit about it. Uh, what's the other one? The, uh, the small squat program. Um, I tried that a little bit and didn't really care for it. Felt like I wanted just straining a hip flexor by just getting tired and lifting anyway. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> not my favorite either. If your program is similar to Ed Kellen, the way he, um Starts with higher reps and tapers down as the weight goes up. Is that what you sort of do? Or you continue to hit the assistance work or assistance with the, the other exercises like front squat and deficits pretty hard? Yeah, I think my, my benching and, and my uh, deadlifting training is, it's if you guys are familiar with Ed Cohen like training, uh, the benching is very simple. It's just uh, I always start my workouts with a pause bench and I basically progress five pounds every week. Uh, so that could be starting with like a you know five rep set, 12 weeks from a meet, and you know every week it's just five more pounds. I'll do at least two sets of the first of the main weight, and it's just a very simple linear progression. Uh, and I'll follow that up with the second exercise, just being benching with uh, with no pause. And so I'll usually lower the weight like 30 or 40 pounds, and and do that weight for several sets just to build up volume. So there's no speed work per se, but just a lot of volume. So Boards, bands, chains. Uh, that stuff was all in the past. <laughs> you had to experiment a little bit. <laughs> Plenty of time for several years benching with uh, benching against boards on like a heavy day and benching off of benching against bands on like a speed day. And uh, yeah, I got very good at those exercises and also very good at 
staying at a 400 bench. So. <laughs> well, well, I've seen your bench technique, and you're probably, you're probably too young to know, but you actually benched the way the original West Side guys invented, where they let the bar sink in and gain momentum. And if you guys don't know, West Side is not Louis Simons. West Side was around way before Louis Simons. And they did a, they had very long workouts, and they benched very, if you haven't seen Dan Green bench, very, very smart. He allows the bar to sink in a long way and gets like a runner at this bench press rather than trying to stop it dead on his chest because it, it's legal. The bar can sink as far as you like and only goes in one direction. So how did you develop that? Because it is a blast from the past that people have forgotten. Yeah, there's, there, there are a couple guys that bench like that. But actually, I kind of got that from one of the guys I trained with and he would do that. And at first, I thought it was kind of silly because he could do a ton of weight that way. But if it was just like a strict touch and go press or an incline press where he couldn't do that, then it's like his his strength was apparently much lower. But what he got out of the technique was was very good. So when I started doing pause benching every week, I started to realize that yeah, if I let the weight relax a little more, just that momentary relaxation uh, of the triceps basically allows you to then be more explosive. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have complained at meets that maybe the referees have you hold the weight of the pause for too long and usually when you're holding the pause your triceps start to feel like they're gonna you know they're just getting tired and cramped and they're gonna you know be dead so that moment when you can let the weight sink into the chest gives you several benefits because uh, first off your triceps are able to then be relaxed and explosive when the press command is given uh, and secondly I like to liken the uh, the bench almost to like a push press so if any of you guys have done Olympic weightlifting and you're familiar with push pressing or, or jerks, um, a very bad technique in the jerk would be to hold the weight all in your hands and not on your chest or collarbones at all. Um, if you do that, <laughs> the weight's not resting on your chest, then you know that like the leg drive can't transmit through your chest to the bar. So you're basically fighting, fighting yourself. You're trying to use your legs, but the weight's in your hands, so you're hands can't transfer that weight from your leg drive. Uh, and the same thing in the bench press. Of course, the trick with the bench press is once you let the weight sink into your chest, your legs can your legs can drive away. They can drive the chest into the bar. But the <coughs> trick is you cannot drive the bar up because then your hips come up. So you've got to drive the weight back. Uh, but gaining that momentum uh, allows you to drive the weight back to the, the sweet spot, which is over the shoulders not over the, uh, the stomach. Not a straight line. Not a straight line, so kind of an arc. So back back over the shoulders and then a straight lockout. It's kind of the way a bodybuilder would, would bench, uh, except, like <laughs> except instead of lowering the weight all the way to your shoulders, you're lowering it to your sternum and then using the, the leg drive to press it back over the shoulders. Elbows, you let them fan out? The elbows, uh, elbows fan out. If you try to bench over your shoulders with your elbows tucked, you probably going to get a very good close view of the bar and the dumps in your face, so, yeah. Uh, when, you fit, when you flare the elbows out, that just allows you to use your delts and your chest a lot, a lot more. Uh, I mean, it's pretty apparent to me that the chest and delts are big muscles, the triceps are smaller muscles, so. Uh, when I train with the bench much more like this, I would find that the weight went too low, you feel like you're just grinding, and this is kind of the same motion as like a dumbbell raise. It's like all shoulders. So if you're benching here, you're gonna, yeah, you, your shoulders get beaten up and your elbows. Uh, but the moment the weight kind of presses back over your shoulders, uh, it's much more in the sweet spot. And training the chest and delts, uh, they can take a lot more, a lot more volume in the training than the, the triceps. So, and again, we'll not see, we'll not see a small chested, like 600 pound bench. <laughs> so. Can I just suggest no one try new techniques tomorrow? Because I reckon everyone's going to be trying to sink their head. Sink their head. Well, it takes a lot of practice what he's talking about. It's basically the Russians call it like a line push press. Dan, so, so can you just in slow motion, because as you were doing that, and I think everyone benches, or 80% of people bench, where they go like that, don't worry about my bench you because I snap bones, but as you go up, <laughs> you leave it like that, you seem to turn your wrist, can you do that in slow motion? Yeah, so you take this? You lower the bar, yeah, your elbows tuck in a bit, yeah. but once, it, once you get the leg drive, elbows, elbows flare out. So this, this position with the arms internally rotated. So if you grip the bar here, you can still tuck the elbows in the way down, but once you get back to the sweet spot, your wrists and elbows are lined up to just press with the, the chest much more. Uh, 
And you're saying, yeah, it's a good point. It takes practice, so don't, yeah, don't, so try, don't try it tomorrow. tomorrow because the spot is will be, uh... <laughs> But uh, it goes along with what I was saying. You asked, you know, like jokingly about how's my central nervous system feeling. Um, well, like I said, when I train the bench, every workout starts with the pause benching. So all the reps are done with the pause. And so in this rip. sense, every rep, every rep. Yeah, so when you're benching with a pause, now it's just the way. It's not, you know, it's not like you have a bench and then when you go to the meet, you're thinking about benching in terms of like, okay, depending on how long the pause command is going to be, I'll be able to retain, you know, so much of my bench, but I'm going to lose some. So this way, you're, you know, you use the pause to your advantage to gain leg drive, to gain, you know, so a bigger if, bench. If you actually train the way you compete. That's really normal. So if you get back to the CNS point. <laughs> When you train that way, you become very efficient in that technique. I find it to be a lot less stressful than, you know, just touching my chest or reversing from the chest to let the weight sink into the chest. Uh, yeah, very, very much less stress-free. So on the shoulders and elbows and central nervous system. I know system. a lot of people don't pause every rep of the bench press, yeah. and what I like in that too is because the pause bench press is the one that we do in a comp. Nobody does quarter squats and says, oh, but on comp day I'll do full squats. They actually train the squat the way they, they actually train the squat the way they do them. It's a long story. The way they do them in the meet. And the same with the deadlift. We don't hitch our deadlifts and then do it properly on the day. But for bench press, for some reason, most people prefer touch and go and then learn the meet. Is that ego or is that just lack of knowledge? Or why, why would anybody perform a powerlifting lift differently in the gym when they don't do it for squat and deadlift, but they will do it for bench press. Is that, what causes it? Uh, I mean, since I don't do that, I'll speculate. But I think, yeah, some people, it's definitely ego. They don't want to They don't want to do pause benching. Uh, some people, I think it's knowledge. So maybe some people have the idea that if they, tra- and probably truthfully so, that if they train with a pause and they're doing it more, more just like holding it at their chest and pressing, that after a couple of weeks, they'll feel like they're burnt out and they're their body is getting broken down more. Um, but that's where knowledge of how to plan out a training program comes into play. So a good technique will keep you from feeling beaten up every week. Uh, and that's where, you know, if you're letting the weight sink into your chest, it's not that your back is relaxing. You want your you want your uh, upper back to always stay tense and controlling the weight. It's just your uh, triceps that will relax a little bit. If you're relaxing your upper back, that's going to cause your shoulders to lose their position. And usually when people say, okay, I can't pause all the time, they feel like their shoulders get beat up. So that to me tells me it's the technique. It's not, you know, it's not that they're doing it too much. Uh, the second thing that would tell me is in benching, I mean, my preference is to do the linear progression. So it's always, it's always a planned progression. It's never just like, well, I'm going to max out today or I'm going to hit a max triple today, uh, which is what I see from a lot of people's programs is every workout builds up to a max. So that I'm speculating might be part of it, but I would definitely think that the technique has a big, a big problem for people who, who want to but refuse to kind of like pause, pause benches and training. Okay, Liam. When you bring the bench down, do you tuck your elbows in and then as you press out, lay them out, or do they stay relatively out when they come in? Yeah, actually more the first way. So I'll keep when I take the bar out, I'll take it out and it's. In, in a meet, it's only one rep, so it's very easy to take it out and hold it over your lower sternum. And as I lower it, it's staying tucked in. But then once I press, then the elbows flare out. Yep. Uh, do you find it hard Speak to transition? Speak up, transi- Jason. Huh? Stand up. <laughs> do you find it hard to transition between wrap squats and raw squats? Because I uh, this little there's this little period where I decided oh, I was just raw squats for a while. Went back into wraps. Took me months to get back to. Where I felt really comfortable, and I've seen you go really quickly between the two. So, does it do your technique change, or do you still squat exactly the same, same stance? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. No, I think what I do is uh, I've done it both ways. Where before a meet, I'll do like many weeks of like wrap squats because I figure, okay, well, if I'm you know squatting wraps in a meet, I'll even do like my warm up sets of light wraps and stuff like that. Uh, but I've kind of figured out that I really only need a few weeks of training with the wraps on uh, before a meet to kind of adapt. And I know some guys don't even, they don't even put the wraps on until the meet. Uh, I think this time around, I I basically built up, you know, my, my regular squat to a certain point, 
and then I said, all right, I think it's time to throw on the wraps for several weeks. So that was just how I approached it this time. I don't know that there's like a best answer to that. I just wouldn't kind of alternate back and forth. When you wrap, you wrap super tight. <laughs> yeah. Right. You switched from the metal silvers to the um, golds. Yeah, the last uh, last meet I, um, I started training with uh, like Titan golds or two and a half meters, and yeah, they just started to feel good. I switched the way that I actually put the wraps on. Uh, previously, I basically just spiraled the weight up and then spiraled the weight down, basically just a <coughs> long series of spirals as tight as I could get them. Uh, this time around, I basically did the weights up, or the, the wraps in one spiral upwards, and then like several X's across the front of the kneecap. Uh, I think what I found with the second way that's been helpful is uh, when you've got too much of the wrap on the back of the knee, um, it makes it hard just to kind of get the feel for squatting down. So the very, like the top half of the squat is very awkward. Uh, switching to where most of the wrap kind of crosses in front of the kneecap uh, has made it so when you get to the bottom, you get a, a big spring out of the hole, but a very manageable balance uh, from the middle to the uh, top of the stance. So I don't know if it was the uh, switch in wraps or just the switch in style. Do you wrap your own knees? Yeah. Uh, just wrap my own knees just because a lot of times I've trained alone, so. Even in a meet? You got your yeah. Knee? Yeah. yeah. At least in a meet, I can get someone else to roll them up. <laughs> yeah. What numbers do you think you're ultimately capable of getting? I don't know. <laughs> I guess. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. See any limits? So. <laughs> well, I think Pozdiv, who's around where you are, I think he squatted four and, and pulled four hundred. Is that right, Max? Yeah. Four hundred k in the training video. Yeah. Four hundred k deadlift in a meet. So you're not there yet. So clearly, if he can do it, you can do it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? Uh, yep. Yeah. Which one in the front? What um. What's the, I guess, biggest problem you've dealt with recently in your own technique or training that you've had to change to get better? Uh, yeah, so I feel like my bench has been the most dialed in for maybe a year and a half. I've really made no changes. Um, and the more it's gotten dialed in, the, like, the more I've just gotten rid of any kind of accessory motion. Uh, the squat, actually, more recently, I've just kind of found uh, that if I don't pull my chest up as much before I begin, my balance is better. I stay back on my heels. Um, my, especially with, with wrap squatting, staying balanced is a little trickier. Um, you know, I've definitely seen and experienced, you know, like you squat down and as you're pushing up, you lose your balance. You shift up your toes, your heels, uh, especially if you've got your wraps on tight. Uh, what I found is just having my chest down uh, allows me to, just kind of stay balanced with my hips back. And uh, so I've been, cons I've actually had the most consistent string of like squatting training days over the last like two and a half months. Um, really haven't lift, missed any weights out of bad technique. So uh, that's that's definitely been the big one. And then the most recent with the uh, deadlifting is just uh, not any technique problems of doing the lift wrong, but just kind of spacing my feet. Uh, inwards a little more to kind of take advantage of having stronger legs and uh, just spacing my hands a tiny bit wider so that at the top my hands will slide past my thighs and not sit in front of them. Uh, Heels or flat when you're limp squatting? Yeah, I like to squat in uh, like Olympic shoes, so definitely like the heels better. Have you squatted both ways? Yeah, I mean, in the past I'd squatted in like more of a casual. <laughs> Pretty much like these, just kind of a casual Nike. Maybe they had like a tiny heel, but mostly a flat, flat shoe. Uh, never in, never in chucks or, uh, or like in my my deadlift shoes. So deadlifting, I'd had the wrestling shoes for a long time, and now the metal, the metal uh, powerlifters or deadlifters, whatever they're called. Those are nice. Jackson, um, how often do you miss reps in training and how often? Good question. Uh, when I bench, pretty rarely. When I squat, uh, 
this time around, I think I've missed just like one one rep in the last three I don't know, three months of squat training. Uh, one thing I really like about Shaco, I, I really like Shaco, um, and uh, you never you never miss reps in training with yeah. Shaco because it's almost always eighty percent. I found that it's it's really good for confidence building to never miss reps. Yeah. And there's someone else I think it was, my, it was uh, Ed Coleman, Captain Kirk. They were saying they n- would never miss reps in training because yeah. they would ruin them for upcoming meets and you feel not the same way. Yeah, if you follow like a linear periodization and your program is based on the idea that every week if you just make a little progress, if you mess up and you miss a weight, then you're kind of like, your plan is just like gone to shit. (laughs) Now you gotta figure out what to do next. Is that because people have had too big an ego and picked too big a target rather than small jumps? Not the target weight for the meet? Yeah, I mean, I think what what I do for my, uh, my progressive training is I'm not picking like a top weight that I want to hit and then choosing percentages of that. I'll basically start at a weight that I know, like if I know my six rep max on, you know, rep benching and I deliberately start, you know, 10 or 15 pounds lighter than that, I'll be able to for sure hit six rep maxes and hopefully continue to hit six reps and, and pass the previous weight. And then when it's the five reps, then it'll be the same thing. I'm trying to, if I progress past the previous five rep max, it's an objective improvement. Yeah. So if you continue to do that, you know you've, uh, you know you're uh, improving. So there's no need to, you know, there's no need to panic. You can stick to your training. Yeah. How, how do you pick your meat openers and attempts? Because I've noticed a lot of your videos, you tend to go really heavy and squat dead, and sometimes miss on like, technicalities or. Yeah. It's not a strength issue, it's, it's, you know, it's a pushing. Yeah, I think when I've done better, <laughs> definitely chosen very conservative squats. Um, all the meets where I've made like three out of three squats, I've started very light. Um, and in hindsight, it's it's pretty obvious that that's a good way to go. Sometimes at the time, you get like caught up and, you know, excited. <coughs> Maybe people telling you like, oh, you'll be fine, just hit that weight. and. Uh, when you start light, it gives you a couple of advantages. One, if you do anything sloppy, you'll still be able to hit the weight without really straining and like fatiguing yourself for the next the next weight. Uh, two, no matter how how sloppy you get, you'll you'll make it. And uh, and three, just getting a chance to get out on the exact equipment that you know on the platform. It's like a warm up, and then you can make adjustments based on how the weight feels. So like if you're in a they got a nice setup here, but I've definitely been at, at meets where you squat on one bar and then you go out and you're squatting on a totally different bar. So when you hit the hole, the uh, rebound of the bar is going to be a little different. Uh, so if you have something where it's light enough where you can make that adjustment after the first rep and there's no there's no like comp, you know consequence of like really straining through the first rep, that's a that's a big plus. It happened to you recently, or oh, not recently, you uh, went to a meet and you were told there would be a special squat bar and it wasn't. And it really mucked up your uh, lifting, didn't it? Yeah, that was last, I think last year, it was like the USPA Nationals. I had uh, warmed up in the back on a, a squat bar that was like a Texas squat bar. And then they basically told me that they would have a, you know, the meat would be on a Texas squat bar as well. But when I got out to lift, apparently on the two platforms, they only had the, uh, the squat bar for like the big guys. So this was like 242 and up. And since I was 220 and down we're just lifting on a regular power bar and uh, I'd also taken a friend's advice and gone as like a 705 opener instead of like a 670 opener so I uh, pretty much just missed it the first two tries and barely made it my third uh, and I had made like 740 in, in training so you prefer the specialist bars and the squat the deadly uh, I think the best thing to do is to just the more you can train on the equipment you're going to use the better you know, if you're going to be like in an IBF meet and you're only using a cue bar for every every lift, then you probably should train that way. <laughs> uh, I like training on a squat bar. It's a little easier on, a little easier without the vibration. So at first I hated it, but now I like it. Do you wrap the knees for all your squat sessions? Yeah. Uh, once I start before a meet, then I will do every session that way. And one of the one of the things that's I think uh, important is I look at the squatting as like there's a an off season and then like a, a meet 
like preparation phase. So before I'm close to the meat, I like to train a lot of volume to really build up like just overall strength in the legs and the back. Um, so that's where a lot of Olympic squatting and a lot of front squatting really come into play for me. So if I were like 20 or 16 weeks out from the meet, I would definitely not be in reps. I would definitely not be squatting with like a low bar position uh, to parallel. I would be doing you know full rep squats. Um, the one thing that started to bother me was my shins would get kind of beat up from just the compression of hitting you know like rock bottom squats uh, twice a week. And so what I did is basically I switched back to my Monday squat days like a back squat day. So I basically would do you know traditional powerlifting squat. And then to get the volume that I liked out of the, you know, like the high bar, medium stance squatting, uh, I just switched it to where you're squatting below parallel and pausing, and then you know coming up from a pause, another head cone exercise like a pause squat. Yeah. So to get, just to get yourself sitting below parallel underneath the bar, uh, to get the thighs kind of building up their strength, uh, that was that was a really big modification for me to like it still squat, you know, like the same lifts but just only beat up my shins once a week and not twice. So that was. That's a big difference. Dan, Lurica? Yeah, from um, a programming perspective, how long does your pre-meet um, training cycle go for? Like, how far ahead do you program? And do you have an off-season pro programming, and what do you do with your off-season stuff? Yeah, so as far as off-season, uh, I'll basically look at, like, the weekly schedule. Like, Monday, I would do, like, an Olympic squat, like, high bar. Uh, Tuesday, I would do military pressing or seated dumbbell pressing like a shoulder day. Uh, Wednesday I would do a lot of front squatting for high volume. Uh, Thursday would probably be a rest day. Friday I would deadlift. Um, sometimes I might just do like the conventional phase if I'm in the off season. Um, Saturday I rest and then Sunday would be like, you know, that would be the bench day. Do you program that work as well or do you just go by field? Uh, I program that stuff as well. And it's basically just progressive so you know, I'm just trying to outdo what I've done the last week. You know, whether that's like hitting the same weight for an extra rep or the same number of reps with a heavier weight, or just hitting the same weight in reps but for more sets to get more work. So if it's more weights, then what can come and say you going down? You said five pounds? Like so for squatting pounds? and deadlifting, probably like 10 pounds at a time. No more. Benching, just five pounds at a time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Liam? Uh, you <coughs> worry about. I'm sorry, I couldn't, Stand up. I couldn't hear you. Do you worry about sort of post-workout nutrition or nutrition timing, or do you just eat? Um, no, don't worry too much about my feet. Or that's a good question. I think when I was earlier in my training, I was like very, very diligent about taking in a lot of protein after working out. Um, if you have a lot of volume and part of your goal is gaining muscle size, it's pretty smart to kind of follow like the way a bodybuilder would do it, where you're trying to eat a ton of car a ton of carbs and protein after you work out. Uh, but now, I mean, especially during a competition phase, I'm not really focused on gaining muscle, so I'm just practicing. It's basically like a practice. <laughs> so when I eat, it's just kind of my feel. Um, on the competition list, what uh, rep ranges do you train the most in? Okay, so like when I squat, if it's a meet where it's with wraps, usually one to three reps. Uh, if it's a meet where no wraps, then it might might be four or five. Um, anywhere from like one to five. Um, for deadlifting, yeah, usually for just off the floor, I like to just do doubles and triples. Uh, occasionally singles, like you know, I'm like susceptible to wanting to max out sometimes, so. So no tens, Max. Did you hear that? <laughs> no tens, no eights. Marcus, no tens. Works. Yeah, I think if you want if you want higher reps, I think the competition lists are not necessarily the way to go because you know the re the range of motion is ideally short. So that's where I like you know an Olympic squat or front squat. The range of motion is great. Um, in a deficit deadlift, the range of motion is great. So you can uh, that's where I prefer to have higher reps. It's kind of like a simpler exercise, so you can tolerate more reps really well. I mean, the whole point of like a power lift is to be engaging so many muscle groups at the same time that you're just maximizing leverage, you just kind of fatigue where your technique is it's kind of like, it's crappy by the time you've done so many reps, so. You speak about the Olympic lifts a lot. Yeah. Uh, do you do any cleans anymore? Uh, not, not anymore. Why did you drop them? The most recent 
use for cleans was basically as accessory work for me. And I would just do like strap up and do hang cleans. Uh, I felt like hang cleans were just great to build up the upper back. So, you know, building up the traps is, I mean, in, in my intuition, it seemed like a good thing, so. Do you do any, do you do shrugs? Do you do any trap work or do you want shrugs? Uh, no, no, no shrugs. <coughs> All the trap work is just from rows so, yeah. and deadlifts. Um, are you like in any pain? And if so, how do you manage that? Yeah. Uh, it's a hard one. Uh, like probably several years ago, I basically got like a bulging disc in my upper back, or three. And uh, so that tends to get aggravated from time to time, like most of the time. So, a little Advil and, you know, just hold your breath when you lift. <laughs> I've noticed uh, your, your mental mindset, those that haven't seen you lift, you tend to never quit and you're fearless. And how important you, and, and you might not think you are, but I, I think that you're fearless and that you will grind, you just don't quit. I think it's one of the reasons why you're so great. Can that be learned in training or that's just your mindset? Uh, it's both. I mean, if you practice a certain way, then you become good at that. So. You you know gotten yourself stuck under some squats that you're grinding through, then yeah you'll you'll be very comfortable doing it once you're in a meet doing that. Uh, as far as the mindset, I mean, there's an interesting thing I think about. A lot of people when I see them train, including one of my best training partners, you know, pretty much before any lift, there's like screaming and you know like you know any, I mean anybody can imagine how you know themselves or training partners will psych themselves up. <laughs> And I kind of noticed uh, some lifters don't really need that. And uh, especially in training, I try not to really like psych myself up. Um, you just focus on hitting the weights, uh, hitting your technique. And when you go to the meet, because you've always just focused on your technique, your technique will be second nature when you're at the meet. And then you can use that kind of like a mental, you know, that mental psych up to, you know, exact an even bigger result from your, from your effort. Russians uh, seem very calm. Russian lifters seem very calm. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you don't very often see them psych up before a lift like yeah. American lifters? Not as much, no, no, no. I, I mean, I've seen some like hilarious things that American lifters do. Like, you know, just like slapping each other and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, not, not, not so much in the, in the Russians. That's not you? Not yet. You don't want to <laughs> Maybe when I get stuck. I'll, I'll resort to that. The other thing I was like, okay, if you have to psych up for every workout, one, it's kind of exhausting, and then two, it's like the psych up is like an exercise in and of itself. So you pretty much gotta, you can never like psych up less than you did the last time, otherwise you're compromising your effort, right? So <laughs> <laughs> it just gets more ridiculous every time. Yeah, Alex. Um, you said that you've dropped almost all bench assistance. What yeah. is the assistance that you keep doing? Yeah. Uh, so when I'm training for competition, like if I'm further out, I'll do one day that's benching, and my benching is only, you know, two to three to four sets of paused benching at the top weight, followed by anywhere from like three to six sets of uh, just regular touch and go benching. So that is the existence exercise. Would just be, you know, maybe like five sets of five or six sets of four, three sets of three. Um, uh, just like a regular touch and go bench. Uh, when I'm further away from a meet, my second day is like a shoulder day. So that's where I'll still train heavy, but I'll do that with a lot of volume, kind of like how a, so you're kind of combining like turning, you know, military press into like a five rep max or three rep max, and then following that, you know, with four sets of 10 or four sets of eight, like how a bodybuilder would build up their shoulders. Uh, it's a pretty simple lift, so getting that high of volume you know, it's going to go a lot further than turning it into like a technique exercise. Uh, but then as I get closer to the meet, uh, and this goes for the front squats and for the military press, they both start to plateau, or I'll intentionally kind of speed up the progression so they plateau faster. And then I'll switch to back squatting twice a week and bench pressing twice a week. So I'll use those as like off-season exercises, but I'll try to, I'll try to exact the most, you know, out of them and then once they plateau, I just drop them. I don't try to force them to continue, 
You know, you're not entering a front squatting competition um, or military competition, so just building up that and then being prepared to tolerate more volume of back squatting and, and uh, benching as you get to the last you know, several weeks, that's my preference. Yep. Do you have a coach or someone who helps you move technique? Myself. <laughs> so just, just me. Uh, I do a video a lot of stuff, and that's, you know, analyzing videos is pretty helpful, both your own lifting and other lifters who are, you know, clearly, you know, either knowing what they're doing. Uh, if you watch a lot of lifters, you can, you can tell yourself, okay, that guy does whatever he does because he's, you know, freakishly gifted or something like that. But usually there is a lot of technical superiority in top lifters, whether or not they have, you know, some anomaly of technique. Uh, and when you see how a good lifter really, you know, you know, maximizes a, a certain part of a technique, you can figure out how, how would that apply to you? Why couldn't you do it or why could you do it? What would you have to, how, what would you have to do to build that technique into your own? So a lot of like watching other people lift and then analyzing my own video, that's, that's the coaching. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, how often when you're preparing for competitions, even during off season, do you choose to deload? Do you just deload on the week before you compete or do you do deload during the fall? Um, yeah, so after Monday, I did my last workout and then that's pretty much it. I worked out as hard as I could until Monday and I've got like three or four days to rest <laughs> for the competition. So there's no deloads up until that point. Just training straight through. Like I said, if you just pick smart weights, you shouldn't be beating yourself up more than what you can recover from. Uh, yeah, now, I, I much prefer to be consistently worked hard but something that I can sustain and recover from, than to like work really hard one week and then back down the next week. I've got a training partner who basically does like three or four hard weeks in a row and then an easy week. And to me, it's like it's like too much of a guessing game. And I also don't want to take it easy for a week, so I'd just rather have better workouts that don't get me beat up. So just um, do you believe that programs work differently for different people? Some people may get something out of the program that someone else may not. Or do you believe that each program should work identically for everyone regardless of what and how it works? Yeah, so I mean, you seem to have this thing like some people don't like small because that doesn't work in the business or the market. Some people think that it's going to be forced to us in this way or it has to be forced to us. So, yeah. But with, and with the D load technique and things like that, it can work for some people. The more it works for people. Think opposed to just you know what's sort of been the book or what people have said. This is what to do, and it's not necessarily what. I think there's one. you know you definitely have to figure out what works for you. Yeah. And when you look at yourself and you and you honestly ask yourself like what is my what are my strong areas, what are my weak areas? You know that doesn't just have to be like technique or body parts. You know that could be like <coughs> flexibility. You get injured when you pull sumo because you don't have the mobility to do it. So every third week you feel like horrible. Uh, in the bench, you have poor mobility. So every time you've benched a couple weeks, your shoulders feel beat up. Uh, yeah, I think as far as how much volume you're training, if you're somebody who's gone from very little volume to very high volume, like a small up program, uh, if the very little volume was because you've been not really training hard enough, and now you do like an appropriately you know, if you choose the weights the effort, appropriately. The effort is key. Any program, the effort you put in, is what you get out of it. I think it's you know, there's a lot of you know, you have to make smart decisions. So you've got to look at yourself. I mean, I think another trick is you know, you can look at some Olympic weightlifting programs and say, okay, well, the Bulgarian lifters, you know, they maxed out like seven times a day on the various lifts every day. So why shouldn't I be able to do that? And I think you know, there's like. It's not just a rhetorical question. There's some actually good reasons why you shouldn't be able to do that. But there are also some reasons why if you can, you know, if you ask yourself that question and you say, well, you know, it's because my technique sucks. So if I lifted seven times a day, I would just get horribly beaten up. Well, you have something to choose that you can address. You can say, well, if my technique gets better. Okay, maybe now I can train more often. So it's always something you can, you can build on. I feel like people get caught up in, 
I can't do something a little bit too often. And there's usually like a middle ground of like, you might not be able to do it now, but you can work and improve towards doing it. So. Okay. Um, do you do anything specific in the way of like mobility work or pre app stuff or anything like that? Uh, sometimes if my IT bands get kind of tight, then I'll just like <laughs> massage them a little myself. Yeah. But that, that's not so much for stretching. Uh, <laughs> stre flexibility is something that if you are not flexible, you should definitely do a lot of work to become flexible or mobile. Um, so if your chest is tight, then you should stretch like in a doorway, open up your chest more, uh, or you know, with like a band or whatever, you know, whatever stretching. There's a million ways to do it. Uh, yeah, if your hips are too tight, to like squat below parallel, or to you know, to get in a good sumo position, you should gain that flexibility first. Once you've gotten the flexibility, it's very easy to maintain it if you just lift with a full range of motion and proper technique. You know, the muscles reinforce the flexibility. So that's kind of my thing is, sure, for a while there was more stretching, but now there's very little. I think it just kind of takes care of itself when you do the lifts. And also, just quickly, have you ever considered lifting a grip or are you happy with it? No. Pretty content. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, is there a um, neglected body part that you think a lot of powerlifters don't train? Uh, what he's trying to ask is, do you think it's going to happen? No, it's not like, for example, when I read the cube, I think, like, he chest, does calf, chest training. Yeah, he does calf raises every Sunday. Um, is there a body part? Um, some, some powerlifters do a lot of ab work. Um, is there something that you would say that, you know, when you just said chest work, what do you mean? Just balls? Uh, just like, uh, this was something I kind of talked about, about doing more of the main lifts, like with the technique that's, you know, like benching with your chest or squatting with your quads, not so much with your, your hips or your lower back. Uh, just kind of using like more traditional techniques and training just like a lot of volume on the main lifts. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of, if you go back and look at, maybe you're talking about powerlifters that look kind of like bodybuilders. It doesn't really need to be like a mutually exclusive, you know, set of like powerlifters and then bodybuilders. If you, Jeremy Hoonstra looks like a bench with benches. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you were to build up your body by just benching, squatting, and deadlifting, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you would look like a bodybuilder and you would be strong like a powerlifter. So I think... You know, using using both the like heavy lifting in the main techniques as well as you know kind of a high volume in the main lifts or the very basic variations of the main lifts, you're gonna build up your you know the proper muscles for executing the main lifts. So yeah, you know, it's like your chest or your quads or your uh, your lats, the deadlift. And, yeah. Last three questions. Finish up. Yeah. Last three questions. Yeah. The questions. questions. When you changed from conventional to sumo, did you find you had to do a lot of work to get into the position that you wanted to be in to pull well from the sumo? Um, so I had a very easy time getting into position, yeah. but I wasn't strong enough to execute the technique. So, like I said, I was flexible, but that really was like that's like passive flexibility. Yeah. So that's the ability to kind of like open your knees or like push your knees out. So I could squat down and grab the bar with my stance very wide. Yeah. So plenty of flexibility, but. My hips were just not strong enough to keep that positioning while I was trying to push with my legs as well as straighten with my back. Um, and so basically trying to build up that hip strength is very hard to do unless you do sumo deadlifting. And what helped me again was pulling with the weights elevated on like four inch blocks. That basically allows you to lift heavier weights for you know shorter range of motion, but you could probably lift the same weight for three to four or five reps in a row and each of those reps, you've got to gain the pressure in your hips to get the weight moving. And in sumo deadlift, the hard part is generally moving a weight, and the easier part is locking it out. Or a conventional, it's like usually you can you can compromise your back position to gain a lot of speed off the floor, and then you have a tougher time locking it out. So yeah, just the block poles allow you to get so much more work of just getting heavy weights moving, that that really builds up both the strength and the flexibility in the hips.
that uh, active flexibility. You, you mentioned lock pools a lot, but we love them at our gym. Uh, a lot of people don't use blocks, they do rack pools where the bar is resting on another yeah. bar, which seems foreign to me. Uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts on using a rack instead of blocks? Uh, I like the uh, blocks, it feels more like a deadlift. Uh, it's very hard to roll a weight towards you on pins. Uh, and then I guess really I did not give the pins as much of a fair chance because having a wide sumo stance doesn't really allow you to pull with the weights in a, you know, in a, in a rack, <laughs> feet are too wide. So, uh, But just overall, I feel like the uh, slamming a bar down on pins versus uh, you know, dropping weights onto like a normal platform yeah, it's always always felt better with the weights on blocks. So more of a personal preference. Mr. America, um, what bars do you train with in the gym? Um, I guess my favorite bars to train with. I have a Texas Power Bar to bench, a Texas Squat Bar that I squat with, and uh, Oki Deadlift Bar that I deadlift with. I've got a Texas Deadlift Bar, but I don't like to train with it for reps. I feel like it a little too much vibration because it's so flexible. So a lot of times, just slamming the weights down, I'll feel like the arms get like <laughs> vibrated too much, especially with the uh, deficit work. So to basically drop a weight that far and hit, hit the ground, uh, yeah, just the vibration. I prefer the Oki bar. Will you ever like deadlift with a stiffer bar, like you know, like an off-season sort of training cycle? Before I did, but um, and I think it, I think it has some good merit. Uh, it's it's very easy in a deadlift if you train with block pulls also to you know build up a certain amount of strength with the straight bar and then have that carry over to a really nice PR once you do train on a, a flexible bar. Um, that's if you train the block pulls as well because you you kind of built yourself up to have perfect leverage at you know the zero inch point, the two inch point, four inch point. So just by having built up all those points of leverage, you're gonna really power through when the bar flexes more and you have more you know more starting <coughs> starting room to work with. Do you do much conditioning work? I can't hear you. Do you do much conditioning? Uh no. <laughs> Pretty much the uh, what I try to do when I'm lifting is basically just get in as much work on the main list as I can. Um, I think I'm at at a point where I feel like if, if I had the energy to do more conditioning work, then I would prefer to just do more weightlifting, so or more days. So. And what about um, recovery techniques? Recovery techniques. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Just <laughs> try to get massages and stuff like that, physios and pyros and another. Yeah, just if I have something that's feeling tight, I'll just try to, I mean, massage it out myself, whether that's like, like you know, elbows or tight hips. So uh, I think like just setting up a good training program and, you know, the better your technique gets, the more you can kind of minimize, you know, just kind of normal muscle soreness and not, you know, like tight joints or injuries or chronic tightness. So. I want to ask you about, um, have you, obviously, I mean, we get nervous sometimes before we go into meets and yeah. our lifts and that. I want to know your mental state, like, have you won, obviously, ever been nervous when you've actually gone into a meet, had doubts in yourself about you know, being able to get your first lift, second lift, whatever it is, and two, what do you do as Dan Green, you know, one of the best powerlifters in the world, actually overcome that? step up on that platform by, you know, you look at the bar like you're going to put the thing apart. And I'm sure that sometimes there's that little bit of whatever's going on in your diet, right? But what, what, what do you do? Like, what? I mean, like, the best thing to be prepared is that you've actually done, you know, like, everything in training the way it's going to be in a meet. Like, if you pause your benches, total confidence that, you know, you're going to bench well in a meet. Um, if your squats are, you know, low in your training, then you're, you know, you're confident. There won't be any issues. So uh, after that, it's just kind of picking smart attempts. And if you if you know you're picking smart attempts, uh, I mean I'm still still nervous, but it's more just putting pressure on yourself. You want to go out and you know execute. <laughs> uh, but I've definitely definitely been nervous. You know, just like anyone else, I'm sure. 
uh, a good a good story about being nervous. When I had gone to Russia, um, here I am in a country where like nobody speaks any English at all, and of course you know, I don't want to go to another country and look like an idiot. So you know, I've got to hit the first squad, and I'm pretty much like the first squatter in the flight. Uh, and the arena is organized like it's a really big place, probably 500 people inside, the big aisleway going up the center, and lots of seating, and lifting on a stage. And so I've got my first squad, and I'm, you know, I'm nervous because it's like I've never seen the bar they're using. There's no like center knurling, and I'm like, am I going to squat low enough? Are they strict? You know, is everything like everything I think about? Uh, fortunately, I chose a light weight because right as I take the weight out, and I kind of look straight ahead as I begin the squat. So basically, at this meet, they had like a girl who was like the ring girl. She's holding a sign with like the weights that you're lifting instead of like a boxing, you know, holding the rounds. And this girl is like naked, <laughs> just painted with like the meat logo. You guys have all seen So as I begin my first squat, my first attempt in Russia, I like look out at the audience and this like very beautiful naked woman is like walking down the aisle towards me. And a little distracted, but you know, it's like made the squat, it was light enough. So even with the distraction, it made that one. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> think picking a proper attempt, then like I said, no matter how how much you mess up, you know, you're gonna be fine. So it's healthy to be nervous, uh, but it's also smart to be prepared. <laughs> what do you, if I ever come with you on, what do you have to do? I think what like, do you do, what do you do for, for that? So like the day before I meet, a lot of people have trouble sleeping. What I try to do is just, stay occupied, so if you're reading or like watching a movie or TV, uh, yeah, the more you sit and like think about what you're about to do the next day, it doesn't help anything, so, uh, you know, you've done that plenty before the meet, you really need to just get some, some rest. Uh, before the last meet, we had gone to a movie and then somebody backed into my car in a parking lot, so we had, <laughs> we had to wait for a tow truck till like 12.30 at night. You know, so well that you normally be stressful, uh, at least distracted from, you know, thinking about <laughs> all the pressure you're gonna put on yourself the next day. So yeah, just preoccupation. Is that about it? Oh, that no, that's right. that's right. It's tiny. It's up to the uh, How many hours a night do you sleep? Less uh, than one. <laughs> not a good question. <laughs> Zero. Uh, yeah, I, I have a lot going on, like a two-year-old and a new job. I'll probably sleep like three hours a night. It's not, not very good. I'd recommend Jesse six. Jesse has a question. Hats. Uh, <laughs> I think that's about it. No more sensible questions that everyone's asked. Yeah. Yeah, all three. It's a pound lift. I'm not a wheelchair. Is that it? No one else? Thank you very much. Thank you.